today we are going to be looking at the First Great Awakening. The American colonies as a whole are falling into spiritual apathy, and they desperately needed to be stirred up again. God answered that need with what we now call the Great Awakening, the spiritual movement that revived the thoughts and hearts and spirits of individuals and also changed the course of the 13 colonies as a whole. The most famous of these preachers and teachers and evangelists that were participating in the Great Awakening is George Whitfield. He was actually an Englishman who came to America. He felt God calling him to America. This really reminds me of, go back to our Jamestown talk, when the Jamestown colonists first come to America and they stop at Cape Henry. They pray to thank God for getting them there safely and to dedicate the colony that's coming and eventually the nation that follows it to God. And Reverend Hunt prays that America and England would be evangelists to the world. And here we have an English evangelist preaching to a whole lot of the world in the American colonies. People are coming from all over the world to colonize the colonies. And the colonies are massive, even at this point in time. The East Coast, where the colonies are being established here, that's a lot of miles. That's well over a thousand miles that you're having to cover. So we are beginning to see the answers to Hunt's prayer. This is a hundred years later. Hunt would never even have imagined this, but we're seeing an answer to his prayer here. So, Back to Whitfield. He was known for being quite an exuberant preacher. He wasn't just dry and boring and monotone. He was very enthusiastic and bright and did a lot of acting. He'd act out parts as he was making his points to make things more interesting for his listeners. A little bit of background information. Whitfield was a university student at Oxford. And while he was there, he found himself drawn to the Holy Club, as it was called, which was led by John Wesley. The club put great emphasis on fasting and prayer and a disciplined spiritual life. Now, due to what critics considered to be their methodical ways, they were dubbed the Methodists. It was supposed to be kind of a slight, but the group took that name on board and started calling themselves the Methodists. So they appropriated the insult and actually turned it into their name. The Methodists use methods. Whitfield then discovered that all the good deeds he'd been doing, all of his methods and all of his good deeds, like he had a prison ministry, didn't do him any good in terms of earning his way into heaven. They were not going to earn him salvation. You cannot earn salvation. He needed to be born again. So, he tried again. What he did this time was he set up some self-imposed asceticism. He basically gave up everything that he enjoyed doing, including the Holy Club, to try to please God and earn himself salvation. Again, he's trying to earn salvation. He's not quite getting it. He even gives up a lot of things that are good for him, like healthy food. He ends up becoming ill because he's driving himself so hard and denying himself so many things. And finally, one day, he just comes to the end of himself and he throws himself on the bed. He cries out, I thirst. Then he says he distinctly heard God say, George, you have what you asked. You ceased to struggle and simply believed and you have been born again. Whitfield was just so happy. He actually started laughing and he rushed out of the room to share God's good news, to tell other people what he had finally learned for himself and what he had gained for himself. He wanted other people to gain too. Thus began the career of the great evangelist of the 1700s. Following his graduation from Oxford, he became ordained in June 1736. Rather than becoming a pastor, he decided he would be an itinerant minister, which meant he traveled around rather than just being the pastor of one church. The first three cities where he preached 
which were Bath, Bristol, and Gloucester, revival broke out after his sermons. Complete mayhem as far as the British are concerned. Revival is out. And yet, Instead of continuing in England, he felt God say to him that he needed to go to the American colonies. His friends, John and Charles Wesley, had already gone to the Americas. They were in Georgia, and they wanted him to come down and and basically help them in the work they were doing there. So he did, and God started working through him in Georgia as well. People became Christians when the Holy Spirit began working through the boy preacher. In Georgia, he was being referred to as the boy preacher. Now, a few months later, Whitfield returned to England because he had this burning desire that he wanted to start an orphanage in Georgia. This wasn't his good works to earn salvation, but he did believe he could help orphans. He really wanted to help orphans, and he was able to get approval for it. And everywhere he went after that, when he would preach, he would raise money for the orphanage. Then he met up with John Wesley, who had also returned to England at this point, and who had also had his own amazing conversion experience with God. So the two of them are now totally on fire and ready to rumble spiritually. So they set out, and they returned to Bristol, the scene of one of the earlier breakout revivals, because they just know Bristol is ready to hear about God. But once they get to Bristol, they find that most of the pulpits in town are closed to them because the preachers there are jealous. They don't like the fact that all this amazing stuff has happened through these two whippersnappers. Who do they think they are? They just got graduated from college, and they don't know anything about being pastors. Really? You're not happy that God is moving just because it's not you doing it? What is wrong with you people? So, Whitfield and Wesley went to the coal mines because the good, respectable pastors in town would not go to the coal mines. The respectable people in town thought the miners, which were called colliers, they saw them as uneducated brutes. In a lot of ways, that reputation was deserved because they behaved really awfully. They were very brutish in their behavior. There was one story about how a murderer had been killed and buried, and they didn't get to see the hanging because he died before he was going to be publicly executed. So they dug up his body and hung him himself and then had a big party. (laughs) So that's the kind of behavior that the Colliers were up to in Bristol and why they were considered to be uneducated brutes. The good people of town stayed far away from them. So, of course, these are the perfect people to go and preach to because these are the ones who most desperately need God. Whitfield and Wesley go, and they start preaching as the shift is changing. So that's the perfect time for them to go. There were a few hundred people there listening to them. Whitfield noted that the coal miners who were coming out of the mines, their faces were completely black from all of the dust in the coal mines. And yet, as he's preaching, Suddenly, he can see these white streaks going down their face. It's from tears because they're crying because they're being so moved by God from what they're hearing. So they went back the next day, and there were 2,000 people listening to them. Now, the religious establishment did not appreciate this. The chancellor of the diocese called him in and said, You got to stop. I don't want you preaching in Bristol again. What a Pharisee. How can you say you don't want these people leading hundreds of desperately needing God people to God? So Whitfield just totally ignored him. And on the following Sunday, there were 10,000 people who were waiting to listen to him, including a whole bunch of people from the town. So we have now the townspeople and the colliers mixing together to hear the gospel. After that, Whitfield and Wesley went all over England preaching the gospel, and revival was breaking out all over England. But at the end of the summer, Whitfield just felt he needed to go home, and to him now, America is home. So he wanted to go back to America to continue preaching and hopefully seeing revival happen there. 
he asked Wesley if Wesley would mind staying in England and continuing the revival in England. And Wesley said, sure, I'll do it. That's a whole other story of all the things that Wesley did with revival in the United Kingdom. But we're going to focus on Whitfield. So Whitfield returns to America, and the 13 colonies are ready to hear him because God's already been moving. Just like it's a powder keg ready to blow. It just needs that little touch. Whitfield preaches all over the colonies. He starts in Philadelphia and he goes up and down the coast, all the way to Georgia, all the way to New England. And remember, this is in the day before cars, before bicycles, certainly before airplanes. He's doing everything either on foot or on a boat or a canoe or on a horse. That's not exactly a fast mode of transportation, any of them. So for him to be covering that much distance means he was on the go all the time. In addition to the fact that he often preached at least once a day, but sometimes two or three or even four times a day, and he had to get there, he was also spending a lot of time writing because he knew the importance of publicizing what was going on. He had a lot of information that he would send to newspapers to prepare the way for them. He also wrote pamphlets and tracts to hand out to people. So he's just busy, 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 busy all the time. He was harnessing the power of the press for revival. If only we could do that again. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? So everywhere he went, revival accompanied him. God was just moving in incredible ways. Those who had been serving God and had seen revival happen in small pockets in their own areas saw him as an answer to prayer because he brought all the small pockets together and made a whole bunch of small ones into one big revival. The first flame lit was in the Raritan Valley in New Jersey in the 1720s. This is a Dutch Reformed church. People don't tend to think of the Dutch Reformed church as being the hotbed of revival, but it was. Frelinghausen was sent there, and he was just totally shocked by the deadness in the churches in the area. He set about doing what he could to fix this. He was just so desiring change here. One of the things he did was he made the Dutch Reformed Church a little more Americanized. At this point in time, a lot of the sermons were still being preached in Dutch. So if you're second, third generation Dutch, you're probably not really speaking Dutch anymore. You're probably speaking English. So he said, we got to stop doing things in Dutch. It'd be like today when you go to a Latin mass, You have no idea what the priests are saying. So it really doesn't do much for you personally because you don't know what the priests are saying. How can it really affect you? So he said, we got to do things in English. We got to give up some of these formalities and restraints that just make it stiff and uncomfortable rather than being a house of God. This is the American frontier here. We need things to be a little more real and and relaxed and realistic rather than being too locked into a liturgy. He also wanted people to have a profound life-changing commitment to Christ rather than just performing their religious duties. A lot of people were just showing up to church because that's what they did on Sunday. That was their religious duty. But it didn't really affect them in their hearts and in their minds. So he wanted to change that. He really encouraged his listeners to examine their lives and to find the sin that's in there. Everybody's done something that they need to address or thought about something or said something that needs fixing. He wanted them to be convicted by that sin and to turn it over to God and to let God change their hearts. He even got a little bit stronger handed here and said communion needs to be reserved for people who are truly on fire for God truly given their lives over to God. If you're just showing up here on Sunday because that's your duty, that's your religious checkbox, I've done that for the day, then you shouldn't be having communion. It was called fencing the table. 
So we put a little metaphorical fence around the communion table to keep out the people that should not have been taking communion because they weren't committed Christians. So Freelinghausa actually made a big difference in his own church and in the churches in the area around him where he would go as a guest speaker. And they found people really responding to this and getting on fire for God in those churches. Thank you for listening to this edition of America's Godly Heritage. I hope you have a great day. Bye. Help us spread our message. If you would like to learn more about America's Godly Heritage or to support us with prayers or finances, you can find us on YouTube, Vimeo, Patreon, Give, Send, Go, most podcast sites such as Buzzsprout and Spotify, and on social media X, Truth, Instagram, and Facebook. You can view the resources used to make this podcast on YouTube, Vimeo, and Patreon. We really appreciate your support. Thanks again. Bye.